Human Rights, Expectation versus Reality, a Summary of the Introductory Class in Human Rights So last night, we held the introductory class on human rights. We discussed what human rights are, their characteristics, and the environment and circumstances in which they exist. Human rights are generally defined as those rights which are inherent in our nature and without which we cannot live as human beings. Human rights are synonymous with freedoms and liberties. As human beings, we aspire to be free to be free from restrictions and limitations. Human rights also equate with equality. Human rights, especially the fundamental ones, level the playing field. All human beings, regardless of sex, age, race, skin color, and location, enjoy the same rights and freedoms. Human rights are not creations of the modern times. Human rights have been an issue since the old ages. When monarchs and tyrants ruled, they ruled under a regime of oppression and abuse. Out of these excesses came the awareness that their subjects were not inanimate things, but human beings who think, feel, and dream. They had rights too. This recognition of and demand for the respect for human rights led to the realization that basic human rights are inherent in a human being, that they are not conferred by the monarchy or the government. Some of these inherent rights are the right to life, liberty, and property. Of course, in time, in the name of improving the lot of human beings, other human rights were legislated and conferred, such as the right to vote, to practice a profession, or to engage in business. This brings us to the simple classification of rights into natural rights and legal rights. Natural rights are those rights that exist because of the nature of human beings. The foremost is, of course, the right to life. But natural rights are not exclusive to the physical well-being. Rather, natural rights also extend to incidental rights that support and put value to the right to life. These rights include freedom of thought, the freedom of movement, and the right to health. Legal rights, on the other hand, are rights that are demanded of and conferred or granted by governments. They vary from place to place and society to society. These rights include the right to labor and the right to just compensation for the taking of one's property for public use. While they are not basic human rights, they add value to life. They make life more worth living. And isn't life about the pursuit of happiness? These human rights are generally addressed to the state or government. It is, after all, the duty of the state or government to guarantee to its citizens that human rights, especially those that are declared in international agreements and declarations, are legislated and observed within its territory. Thus, if the state or government is remiss in guaranteeing or protecting these human rights, it can be compelled to take affirmative action or to desist from acts or policies that violate these human rights. Moreover, human rights are also addressed to private persons. It is everyone's business that human rights do exist and are respected. This is consistent with the Confucian doctrine that you must do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If one person values his human rights, it goes without saying that he would want others to also enjoy theirs. The remedy against a violation of human rights committed by a private person is a civil suit for damages. As to the characteristics of human rights, they are as follows. We already mentioned inherent. Human rights are inherent because they are not granted by any person or authority. They do not need any event for their existence. Human rights are fundamental. Without them, the life and dignity of man will be meaningless. Human rights are inalienable. They cannot be rightfully taken away from a free individual. Human rights are imprescriptible. They cannot be lost even by a long passage of time. Human rights are indivisible. They are not capable of being divided. Human rights are universal. They apply to all human beings irrespective of their origin, status, or condition, or place where they live. Human rights are interdependent. The fulfillment or exercise of one cannot be had without the realization of the other. Human rights are ideals. We advocate for human rights because they make us better human beings. Human beings are different from other species or creations. Physically, we are agile, stronger, and resourceful. Mentally, we are intelligent and reasonable. Emotionally, we are sensitive and compassionate. 
Thus, human rights assure us that we can act and move better, that we can think and decide more wisely, and that we can feel more empathy for others. Human rights, however, are not absolute. They have limitations. Human rights carry the responsibility that they must be exercised in such a way that they do not trample on others' human rights. Also, human rights can be restricted by the state for public order, safety, and security. Thus, the freedom of speech and expression is not protected when it becomes libelous or seditious. Also, the freedom of movement and travel can be restricted in the interest of public health and safety. But what if the line between right and restriction is blurred? How do you resolve the conflict? International law and domestic jurisprudence provide that right is the general rule and restriction is the exception. Human beings must be given as much chance and liberty as possible to exercise and enjoy human rights. After all, it is presumed that human rights are good, that they are not wrong. Thus, if they are to be restricted, it is the burden of the government or those who restrict them to prove that the exercise or enjoyment of human rights is against the rights of another or against the law, public policy, or interest. Sadly, at present, the permissible restrictions are abused to the point that they have become the general rule and the exercise or enjoyment of human rights has become the exception. There are so many restrictions in place that one has to check what is permissible. You want to criticize the government, freedom of thought and speech. You want to gather in a public place to air your grievances, freedom of assembly. Or you want to engage in business, right to property and livelihood. Think twice and check if the government will allow it. This is prior restraint, pure and simple. Prior restraint is antipathetic and injurious to human rights. Prior restraint, especially when exercised by the government, reverses the gains of the cause of human rights and brings back memories of tyranny and oppression. When democracy becomes only a style of government but not a way of life because of the restrictions in place, then democracy defeats its purpose. That is the sad truth. This is our reality. But why do they impose a lot of restrictions? Their ready answer is that people are irresponsible and that they do not know the limits of their rights. However, this belief is counterintuitive and counterproductive. It insults the human value. It is this kind of hard-handed policy that prevents people from being responsible and aware. Human rights are a work in progress. Other cultures and societies are leagues ahead, not because the government imposes restrictions, but because the people are empowered to learn and act justly and responsibly. Their people are allowed to commit a few mistakes here and there without fear of punishment or incarceration. Why? Because people are not perfect but they can learn. In these other cultures and societies, human development is superior. Why? Because when you allow a human being reach his best potential, and if you do the same to all, then you get the best society that everyone deserves.